Hello, my name is Gideon Cordova and this is my two cents adjusted for inflation. There's just been a terrific blog post by Professor Bill Mitchell where he talks about Stuart Chase, who was an American economist writing around the time of World War II. In his little booklet, he asks where's the money coming from and he gives the examples of nations like Italy, Germany, Russia and Japan, which before the Second World War were all practically insolvent. They all had very weak economies. They were lousy credit risks, they had a lousy credit rating rather, and they had very little stocks of gold. So how was it that they were able to mobilize these massive armed forces and spend all the money that they did on armaments? And sure enough, you will never see a nation voluntarily uh, bailing out of uh, a war when they're under attack and just saying, look, we can't afford to keep fighting. We've run out of printed paper notes. They can always print more notes. What they can't print more of is real resources. The actual um, people, the manpower and the natural resources that they have available to them to mobilize in order to, to fight. But if we can do that during wartime, why can't we do that during peacetime? Surely the principles still apply. So we've told the story that taxes are what fund spending. When the government wants to spend, first they need to raise the money in taxes or in borrowing by issuing government bonds in order for them to be able to um, start purchasing things in the real economy. Let's use the example of an old Roman village. Here's Pompeii. The myth that we're told is that in order for Pompeii to become a nice city with aqueducts and roads and schools and, and, uh, and nice tree-lined streets, in order for the government to spend and build such a nice city, they need to raise money in the form of taxes from the people that live in Pompeii. And the only way that you can pay off your tax liability to the government is by giving the Roman government their currency. They don't accept payment in chickens and they don't accept uh, if you offer to do the guttering on Parliament House. They don't accept that. They only accept these Roman coins. Well, where did the Roman coins initially come from? If you printed them at home, if you minted them at home, you'd be in trouble as a counterfeiter. Only the Roman government could issue the coins. It's the same in Australia. Where did the Australian government get the money? They get it from the Reserve Bank of Australia. They get it from the Department of Treasury. They get it from Note Printing Australia, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Reserve Bank of Australia. They get the coins from the Royal Mint, which is run by the Department of Treasury. They issue the money. If you issue your own money, you'll get in trouble. You'll be a counterfeiter. Only the Australian government can issue the money. So they, first of all, have to issue the, you the money, and then they can take a portion of that back in taxes. So it clearly doesn't fund their spending. Imagine when you go into the theatre and they rip your ticket in order for you to get into the theatre. They tear the ticket. They had to issue you the ticket first before they could tear it, right? It stands to reason. So if the government doesn't necessarily need your taxes to fund spending, why did they bother taxing you in the first place? Well, firstly, it gives value to the currency. What do I mean by that? Well, a good example is in the hut tax, which took place in the uh, middle of the 1800s in Africa. The United Kingdom wanted, or I guess it was Great Britain, wanted people in Africa to work for them. So they went along to the people and they said, hey, would you like to work for us, work in our fields? Um, that would be really handy. And the people said, no thanks, we're fine. We're just doing our own thing. We don't, we don't want to work for you. Well, the British government said, how about we give you these shiny coins with a picture of the Queen's head on it? And the people said, no thanks, we don't really have any use for those shiny coins with the Queen's head on it, totally irrelevant to us. So the government said, the British government this is, they said, okay, well, there's now a hut tax. For every hut that you have, you've got to pay a tax on. And the tax on that hut has to be paid in the British currency. Well, where were the people going to get the British currency? The only place that they could get the British currency was from the people who were offering it for their labor. So sure enough, the people started working for the authority in order to get the currency in order to pay the tax. So one of the primary reasons for taxing people in the first place is to make sure that they use your currency. As kind of a fun fact, uh, Hyman Minsky famously said that anybody can issue their own money, the trouble is getting people to accept it. And indeed, in the olden days, a lot of kings often had problems trying to get people to use their currency of issue to the extent that they would regularly punish people for refusing a king's coin. A second reason for taxing is to control inflation. If you reduce the amount of purchasing power that people have, then they can no longer be bidding for an excess number of things in the marketplace. Imagine that we're all shopping at the same supermarket. 
and there's only a certain number of things on the shelves. Both the government and the private sector is bidding for these limited number of items. Now, if everybody has heaps and heaps of money, then the and and is trying to buy the the, the same things, and there aren't enough of those things to go around, then the price of those things will likely go up. Let's say ten people want to buy the same two Mars bars. Well, if we all have lots and lots of money, then we're willing to pay. I'll bid a hundred. I'll bid two hundred. I'll bid seven hundred. The price of the Mars bar will go up and up because people are willing to pay more to get those limited number of Mars bars. So, in order to avoid the price inflation, the government can tax, take away people's purchasing power. So that's another useful thing that taxes do. A third thing that taxes do is redistribution. If one sector of the uh, economy is just getting way ahead of everybody else, let's say the banking sector, if they're really, really powerful and, and a few people have vast amounts of wealth, they'll then be able to buy the political process, they'll be able to buy their own mercenaries, they'll be able to create, create political instability. Well, you want to avoid that, you want to keep the power in your hands, so it's important to have a redistributing function of taxes. To take from people who have a bit too much, redistribute it to people who don't have enough. It's not the same as funding spending though, it's just redistribution. That's its function, not funding spending. Remember, the government can spend whatever it wants, it can purchase anything for sale that is for sale in its own currency. It's very different from saying it should do that, I'm just saying that it can. It's not fiscally constrained, it can never run out of points on its scoreboard. It can never run out of the currency that it issues. As long as there's one person in the Reserve Bank of Australia with one finger who can keep hitting zeros on his keyboard, that's how much Australian dollars, that's how many Australian dollars we can issue. There's there's no limit on the on the number that you can punch into that Excel spreadsheet. Just keep adding zeros, it's fine. There's, it's not like every time they uh, issue some money or every time you pay your taxes, nobody's at the Reserve Bank of Australia hammering gold coins into a computer or dropping some cash in a bucket. It doesn't work like that. It's just numbers that go up and down in a spreadsheet. And you can play that fun game at home by looking at your internet bank account. You can see that just before you get paid, you have, let's say, $1,000 in your account, and then you get paid, and all of a sudden, there's $1,500 more. The person on the other end of their computer isn't hammering a gold coin into the computer. They're not dropping money into a bucket. They're simply changing the figure up in the Excel spreadsheet or down in the Excel spreadsheet. And it's exactly the same when you get paid welfare payments. The government that offers you, that gives you the welfare payments, they bank at the Reserve Bank of Australia. They don't bank at uh, a local commercial bank like Commonwealth or Westpac or NAB. They have uh, accounts with the Reserve Bank of Australia. And sure enough, when your welfare payment comes in, they just increase the number of in the in the spreadsheet and or variously decrease it in their account in the treasury's account at the reserve bank of australia so it's just numbers up numbers down it's just a way of keeping score it's got nothing to do with the amount of real stuff it's just a way of keeping score another useful thing about taxation is what's called the pogovian aspect of of taxation basically behavior modification so if you don't want people to drink as much alcohol or you don't want people to smoke as many cigarettes, if you increase the tax on those items or those behaviours that you don't want people to participate in, they're more likely to stop doing it. So that's a good example when we don't want people to be financially speculating. People have suggested, oh, we should put a, a financial speculation tax. But that's not to fund the spending because bear in mind, if your tax works, then people won't participate in the behavior anymore. So you can't plan to fund a whole economy simply by taxing uh, parasitic financial traders. Because bear in mind, when the tax becomes too high, people will stop participating in that negative behavior. So your revenue will go down to zero. As soon as cigarette prices go up to $10 billion a packet, nobody will be buying cigarettes. So you couldn't rely on that as your only source of income. Again, taxes aren't funding spending. They, they have other merit and they have other purposes, but spending is, is not one of those purposes. So who's going to take care of Australia's ageing population? And what is the real constraint that we face? Is it the amount of Australian dollars that we have available to us? Or is it the real resources? Well, here's a quote from Alan Greenspan, who was the former chairman of the Federal Reserve in the United States. He said, a government cannot become insolvent with respect to obligations in its own currency. A fiat money system, like the ones we have today, can produce claims without limit. So, 
even though the money is nice to have, you can always increase the number in the spreadsheets. The real constraint is do you have talented people to, to work in, in your various jobs that you require? Do you have enough natural resources? Is, is the planet still inhabitable? Those are the real constraints. But if you bury $75 in a jar, hoping that in 100 years it'll still be able to purchase you exactly the same stuff that you have now, newsflash, it's not going to happen. This is why we should reconsider the idea of things like the Australian Futures Fund taking money, <laughs> issuing 20 billion Australian dollars, and then speculating on financial markets. Is that the best use of the Australian dollars? or? Could we do something more productive with that? Because bear in mind, if in 20 years we didn't have that Australian Futures Fund, we could just issue $20 billion at the time. It would be fine. There's there's no constraint on the Australian government. There's no there's no involuntary constraint. There are plenty of voluntary constraints that they don't want to issue it without um, because of political expediency or because of their their personal ideology. They may not want to issue it, but that's a voluntary constraint. There is no fiscal constraint on the government, which has a, a sovereign issuing monopoly capacity to issue its own currency. There's no fiscal constraint on them doing so. So Alan Greenspan has told us that they can always issue more money if, they're, uh, if you are a, a currency issuing government. So too has Chairman Ben Bernanke, who was the previous chairman of the Federal Reserve before Janet Yellen. He said when he was asked about the um, the TARP bailout during the global financial crisis, he was asked on 60 Minutes, is that tax money that the Fed is spending? Bear in mind, there was a massive bailout of all the Wall Street banks. So Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal Reserve, was asked, is this tax money you're spending? To which he replied, and I quote, it's not tax money. We simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account. Easy as that. So when it comes to government deficits, there's three kinds of economists. There's the deficit hawks, and these people think that you should never run a government deficit. They think it's bad for the economy, it's bad morally and ideologically, it's it's, a, it's an immoral thing to do, and they, well, unless it's a time of war, in which case, usually, when it comes to killing people, you can always deficit spend. I mean, nobody's going to give up on a war just because they can't issue enough money. Just print more money, just print more money. It's a war. So the deficit hawks think, apart from the circumstance of war, you should never run government deficits. Then there's the kind of bird, the deficit doves. The deficit doves say, well, in when the, econo when the economy is not doing well, it's okay to go into deficit in order to stimulate the economy, but as soon as things go back to normal, as soon as things pick up, that's when you need to balance your budget again, the government shouldn't be running deficits. Then, of course, there's the deficit owl. Now, an owl can see in the dark. An owl can turn its head right the way around and see things that other people can't see. And the deficit owl realises that running a government deficit isn't a problem. It isn't a problem because as a sovereign monopoly issuer of a free-floating fiat currency, the government can never go broke with respect to obligations it has in its own currency. If it needs to pay more interest payments in its own currency, it can just issue the money. It's the currency issuer. I tried to play a game of Monopoly where the central bank had to always balance its books. So that is to say that you couldn't receive $200 for pass and go until the central bank had collected $200 in taxes and fines. And sure enough, it was a very short game. You see, because in Monopoly, the reason that the central bank issues you $200 every time you pass go is so that you can keep playing. If the government had to wait until it received money in the first place from you, then the economy would stagnate and there would be very slow growth. There would be no credit markets and it would be very difficult to function as a productive society. The, the, issue, the board game Monopoly recognises something that the Australian government currently doesn't recognise, which is that the Australian government, as the monopoly issuer of the Australian dollar, is not fiscally constrained with respect to liabilities that it has to pay in its own currency. All it needs to do is issue more money. But that's not the same as saying that it should issue more money. Obviously, if you issue too much money, you can create dastardly inflation. But <laughs> right now, Australia is not at risk of going into hyperinflation. In places like Zimbabwe, which had hyperinflation, the reason it did was because Zimbabwe had decimated its productive capacity. It, it wasn't producing as many goods and services as it 
was before, and yet it was still printing more and more money. Not to mention that, but also its it, economy had completely shrunk. Under the Mugabe regime, they gave away, they redistributed land away from people who knew how to farm and gave it to people who didn't know how to farm. So all of a sudden, farming exports dropped, which was the mainstay of the Zimbabwean economy. Not to mention that, but they were printing lots of Zimbabwe dollars and converting them into US dollars and taking the money offshore. Well, very quickly, the people who were converting, who were giving American dollars in return for Zimbabwe dollars, realized that those Zimbabwe dollars weren't worth very much because there were no real goods and services coming out of Zimbabwe to, to back up that currency, to give it any value whatsoever. So immediately the value of that currency started to collapse, but that process of trying to convert them and issuing more and more in order to convert them into a foreign currency and take that money overseas quickly spiraled out, out of control. The other example of hyperinflation might be Weimar Germany. Well, in Weimar Germany, after the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles made Germany pay reparations in gold, that, and Germany had been decimated in terms of its industrial capacity, and it had lost Alsace-Lorraine. So again, a massive diminution in the amount of production that was taking place in the economy, and at the same time, they had to pay these vast reparations, convert their, their uh, Deutschmark into gold, and very quickly, the people selling the gold in return for the Deutschmark realized that the German government, the Weimar administration, wasn't able to create any goods and services that would, in any reasonable way, match the value of the currency. So a democracy like Australia is in, is in no risk of running into a hyperinflation. And the, the reason I know that is because right now we have 1.8 million underutilized people. That is, they're either unemployed or underemployed. Those people are not being competed for in the private sector private sector isn't hiring them. So you know that if the government issued some more money in order to purchase that unused labour, because the private sector isn't competing for those for those people at, at the moment, well of course there would be no bidding war because the private sector doesn't want them. The government issues the currency so they could always issue the currency in order to pay a decent living wage to people in return for goods and services and as long as those people who you're paying are producing goods and services, then the productive capacity of the economy will be increasing. So the economy will be getting better and the inflation risk is reduced. That's all we've got time for this episode, but I'll catch you again next time. My name's been Gideon Cordova. This is my two cents adjusted for inflation. I'll catch you next time.